Thank you. And many thanks to the organising committee for inviting me. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about post-approval change management protocols. I'm going to give you an idea of what the PACMP, the post-approval change management protocol is, how it impacts change, some ideas of the structure of PACMP, and then finally give you a flavour of our experience with this tool. And I have to confess, PACMPs are a bit of a love of mine. Of all the tools, regulatory instruments that I've seen, particularly with Q12, I think the PACMP is one of the most elegant of those. So, a PACMP, a very useful tool. So what is it? Well, what we can see from Q12 is that the PACMP is a regulatory tool that provides predictability regarding the information required to support a CMC change and the type of regulatory submission based on prior agreement between the ME holder and the regulatory authority. Such a mechanism enables planning and implementation of future change to establish conditions in an efficient and predictable manner. I've highlighted some words in red there because they are really important. PACMP is about predictability. More than that though, it's about working with the agency to achieve prior agreement on how we move change forward. And that's important to us because in having that prior agreement, it gives us a level of predictability and enables our planning and implementation of what can be some very complex and intensive changes. Essentially what that boils down to is us splitting a discussion of the strategy with a discussion of the data. And the PACMP is quite a flexible tool as well. We can either submit it with a new drug application or with a discrete set of post-approval changes. And not only that, we can generalise the PACMP so it can reflect either a number of changes closely related on the same product or indeed across products. So this is a really nice illustration of what we mean by that. If you think about traditional post-approval change management, we're used to presenting the strategy and the data in one regulatory interaction. We talk about how we intended to move the change forward and also the data that supports the change in one interaction. It's reviewed as one package by the agency, but crucially, before we can make that submission, we need to generate the data, which means that it's time limited. Not only that, it assumes that that strategy has been agreed before we make the change, before we make the submission. What a PACMP allows us to do is make this as a split. Now that sounds like it's less efficient because we've got two regulatory instruments there. But actually, what we have is the ability to discuss the strategy with the agency first, modify, agree, move forward before we actually generate any data. And that's a real advantage. That first submission is usually quite intensive, be a prior approval supplement or maybe a type two. But that second submission with the data in it is usually a lower classification. And because we've already agreed how we'll approach it, it becomes a much less intensive operation. So the two steps are illustrated here. Step one, the PACMP, is that written protocol, including detailed rationale for change, the risks identified with it, the kinds of studies that we're going to perform and the kind of acceptance criteria we're going to be held to, the reporting category that we intend to submit the data under, and the other supportive information. And all of that gets agreed with the agency up front. Then later, we carry out the tests, aligned with that protocol, generate the data and submit those, provided of course that they're right. So what's the advantage to this? Well, there's transparency and predictability. You've got all that opportunity for the agencies to put awareness of our upcoming change, but also for us to agree that strategy up front with the agency. 
We've got the opportunity to agree the data package that supports that change with the agency. Agree the conditions that we will fulfill when we implement that change. And ultimately, the opportunity to reduce waste work, both for us and the agency. And crucially, reduce that time to implementation significantly. Now, how significantly are we talking here? This is a really nice cartoon from the Q12 training module four. Here you have side-by-side -side comparison of the traditional approach for site transfer and a PACMP approach. You can see at the top, we're looking at uh, introduction of a new site. We have to go through a series of construction, qualification, and data generation steps traditionally before we engage with the agency. And then usually have an intensive review period before we can enable shipment. If you look at this in contrast with PACMP base, you can see here that we can start negotiating with the agency the strategy for that change before we actually generate any information. Then once we have that agreement, generate the data and then notify. And this is very important because at this point we can generate a level of security on the kind of information we're going to um, generate, the kind of data that we need to support that change before we ever put it into practice. In this situation, we don't actually engage the agency until after we've generated that data. So there's a real threat here for questions. In this scenario, we're assuming that everything goes well. And even in that basis, there's about a five month difference in the time of product shipment. Add in any questions to that, that five months can become seven months, 12 months or even longer. So it's a real saving here. What about the content? What actually goes into this? Well, we need to, we need to establish that we've got significant suitable scientific knowledge and understanding of aspects impacted by the proposed change in order to conduct appropriate risk assessment. This is really important. In essence, the post-approval change management protocol is a quality risk management document. At its heart, that's what we're talking about. The amount of information in the PACMP depends on the level of complexity of the change. Clearly, if we're looking at something which is relatively straightforward, the amount of information and scientific understanding that we need to demonstrate would be lower than for something that's quite intensive. Q12 outlines various uh, elements that should be in the PACMP, and it's quite prescriptive. Running through from the description of the proposed change with its rationale, those risk management activities, the proposed studies and acceptance criteria that we'll use to assess the change, other conditions, the proposed reporting category, which is very important, and any other supporting information. Description of the change is quite important. Now, it seems obvious, but a lot of these changes are not simple, which means that it's incredibly important that that change is adequately described. And not just the headline change, but any other changes underneath that. Most of these complex changes are not simple one change. They have other elements baked into them. And it's important that from the risk assessment perspective that those other changes are clear. It's also an opportunity to highlight any other background studies that support the risk assessment and plan for future work. Things like small scale evaluations, pilot or engineering work, knowledge from other uh, entities and similar uh, platform or prior knowledge all of which supports the assessment of risk to quality. This is probably the most important section of the PACMP. 
It's important that we set out the potential risks or impact to quality as a result of the change and evaluation of that risk and approach to any mitigation. That's, that's really important because it then sets up the expectations of that confirmatory work. I can't stress this enough. That risk assessment is the backbone of the PACMP. There are many ways to do this. Some changes may be simple enough to convey that risk in, tech, in a textual format. Others may require other tools. One of the ones that we found most useful is in a tabular format. But it's always important to convey the risk of that change to any impacted, potentially impacted CQAs. This is an example risk assessment that I have drafted based on a sort of fictional uh, drug, subs uh, drug product. Here you can see a mix of text and tabular format conveying elements of the impacted CQAs um, and the risks outlined and also crucially the risk control work that we intend to uh, perform to uh, mitigate any of those potential risks. You can see here some of these low risks and their evaluation. Here we have the GMP status of a new manufacturer, rated low risk because the site is already authorised, compared with say, changes to the physical chemical properties here, rated moderate risk. Some discussion of that and then some allusion to the kind of work that we'll perform to mitigate those risks. This section is, is really the basis of that agreement with the agency. This is how you set that strategy up and get that understanding with the reviewing body of the kind of work that you need to do to mitigate the risks that that change presents to your product. Following on from that are the kind of studies that you've already signposted from the quality risk assessment. These studies are usually related to the particular CQAs. They might be part of your specification testing, but they might also be extended. There might be some more extensive characterization that's required. Uh, may be necessary to look more broadly into the, uh, the stability or even force degradation studies to help uh, to help mitigate those risks. What's also important is that you set up the expectation around what the acceptance criteria are for those um, tests. Often these will be statistically based. Sometimes they'll just be straight limits from your uh, specification testing. But more often than not, there'll be an element of statistical analysis that's needed in order to set up appropriate bounds for those. Again, as part of the agreement with the agency, it's important to set up what you will provide to them as part of the implementing submission. Both the content and also the, the reporting category for that implementing change. Clearly, it needs, it needs to be uh, clear to the agency what you will intend to uh, provide in the implementing submission, both in terms of the data and also the updated CDD sections and also the kind of level of change you're expecting from that implementing submission. Usually the implementing submission is one level lower than the corresponding change would be from guidance. So from a European perspective, if that change was rated type 2, we would expect to see a type 1B as an implementing change. As with all of this, this is part of the agreement with the agency. So in summary, again, taking from ICHQ12 training module four, these are the uh, components and step highlights for um, PACMP. You can see the correspondence there between step one and step two. PACMP doesn't have any validity in terms of data. So there's no point at which the PACMP becomes out of date, but what it can happen is that your validity changes with time. So whenever you use the PACMP, you have to assess whether the, the original risk profile that you set up is still valid. 
And obviously that can change with time, particularly as, a, as you gain more knowledge on the product. If the, vali the validity of that risk assessment and those original covenants change, then you need to interact with the agency to make updates to that PACMP. And usually that notification will de be dependent on the kind of changes you want to make to the PACMP. If the changes are relatively minor, then perhaps a not notification will be all that's required to update PACMP in line with your state of knowledge. However, if the, you're making large scale changes, changes to the acceptance criteria, changes to the statistical treatment, or indeed changes to the risk assessment itself, then clearly that will uh, require a more intensive in, um, interaction with the agency. PACMP is a protocol. And there's always the chance that your data doesn't match what you set out. If that happens, it means that PACMP can't be invoked. It doesn't mean this PACMP is no longer valid, but it means for that change, you can't use the kind of agreements that you had with the agency in order to, to implement the change. So then you need to use a more traditional approach or update the PACMP. Now we're going to have a look at some of our experience. We've used PACMPs extensively over the last 10 or 15 years. And I think increasingly we're using them in support of our biological portfolio. We have used PACMPs to manage post-approval change in a sort of discrete way in lifecycle management. But we've also included PACMPs with new registrations. And I think increasingly we are looking to whether we can platform PACMPs and add them to all new registrations. Why biologics? Well, it's simple. Usually change for biologics has higher reporting categories with longer approval times. If you think about a site change, again, from a European perspective, for a synthetic molecule, a simple site change is a type 1B application. And in fact, in Europe, a type 1B application, which you may not have to wait for stability to support. So it's quite a simple thing to do. Site change for a biologic is a type 2 variation across the board. So clearly there's a motivator there. Also, the supporting data that you will be expected to provide in support of post-approval change for biologics tends to be more extensive. When we're talking change for biologics, we tend to be invoking ICHQ5E and the sort of analytical and process compatibility which is necessary to ensure that we have the same product pre and post change. You don't need to go very far with a change for a biologic before it becomes much more intensive as well. So there are clear advantages to it, both in terms of time, but in terms of predictability for biological products. For synthetics, we do use them. We have used them successfully. And we're using them more, especially where we are in atypical synthetic products. Either we are looking at enabled products where we have uh, an enabled formulation, so complex biopharmaceutics, or where we're looking at the need for predictability because of complex change. Where there are real advantages to PACMPs are for novel products. So anything where the guidance is ambiguous. If you think about most guidance, it tends to fall into uh, two or three different categories. You know, we either think synthetics and we have, a, we have a model in our heads about what that means, or we think biologics and we have a model in our heads of what that means, or aseptic products, so forth. When we are into the kinds of products that we are increasingly seeing as a company that don't fall into normal regulatory guidance buckets, then PACMPs can be a real advantage. In fact, got one of those here. So these are, these are just a few of the cases where we've used PACMPs successfully. 
And that first one is one of those atypical products. Here we're looking at highly accelerated oncolytic antibody drug conjugate product. This product, highly accelerated, very constrained supply chain, both complex in times, terms of its data, but also critical in terms of its time scale. And we use PACMPs for drug product manufacturing scale increases and, and the rapid expansion of product volume. Here we needed predictability and speed. And we used the PACMP approach along with our partner in various jurisdictions. Crucially, what that gave us was the ability to implement change in a very quick and predictable way. And again, thinking about that product guidance, the complexity of this change com compounded by the ambiguity of the guidance meant for a real advantage in using the PACMP approach. The second one highlighted here is a more traditional product, um, an oncolytic MAB product. Here we've used multiple use PACMPs to use repeatedly for new site introduction. Here we are talking about simple changes but time sensitive changes and the expansion or scale out of our product to new sites. Real advantage here is in the quicker implementation of new scale. So that reuse, the ability to use the PACMP multiple times for similar changes across a product's life, life cycle. Final one here is a complex change. So here we have a site change, but an associated change to the packing components. And in this case, we have a multiple strength product as well, multiple presentations. So the advantage of the PACMP in this case is in that strategic discussion, in teeing up the strategy for the change and the kind of data that's needed to support it. That gives us that benefit of certainty over the data package and the ability in this case to agree a matrix stability approach to help with that change. So a real advantage in predictability. So where are, where are we now with PACMPs? We've had PACMPs in many jurisdictions for a long time, but they've never been quite harmonized. So the good thing about Q12 is it's given us a level of certainty with those PACMPs, and that's important. And we've seen the PACMP format added to local guidance in multiple markets now. And in fact, the US refined their uh, compatibility protocol guidance last week, published it finally, uh, with a very helpful Q&A added to it. So we've got those codified now in EU, Switzerland, USA, and Japan. We've got pilots ongoing in two other markets, notably Canada and Brazil. We also have other things. So ICMRA have sponsored a collaborative assessment of PACMPs as part of their ongoing activities to try and harmonize um, review and inspection across the world. And we've had informal interest expressed by other markets as well. And I think the useful thing with PACMPs is it's a tool that people can understand. So we've seen a lot of agencies wanting to know more about PACMPs in particular. So that's a positive. The negative is there is still a lot of variability in the implementation of the tool even in markets that we understand. So what would we like to see? Well, it would be great if we could see increasing global alignment through either work share or reliance mechanisms so that we you could use the same PACMP globally. We have products that we market globally. They're all the same. They're all one product for one world. So why not have one PACMP that fits It'd be really useful if we could use standardized PACMPs for common platform changes. 
if our expectations were modelled throughout the world, it would really help us to move change forward. And if we could have those hanging off our documents from first principles, it would help us to access more of the world more quickly and serve patients better. You know, and work towards that one PACMP fits all globally. So the PACMP enables planning and implementation of future change in an efficient and predictable manner. And it's that planning, implementation and predictability that really wins for the PACMP. Using PACMPs, we can access post-approval changes quicker. We can get prior agreement and work with the agencies as part of our, our uh, change strategy. We can have certainty over the data package that we provide and overall reduce the burden of reuse uh, and rework with both agencies and ourselves. We see more and more interest in PACMPs from agencies around the world. I think we'd like to hope that in the future we can drive towards much more of a one PACMP fits all globally for future change. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues in AZ, uh, Adam Steele, Mark Pellet, Jane Duncan, Frank Montgomery, Diane Wilkinson, and Nancy Kavanagh for their input into this. And I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention today.